So just to introduce myself quickly, my name is Kai and I come from New Zealand. Um, I'm from Germany originally and moved down there about 20 years ago. And I'm a developer slash architect and I do Android, some backend work, I've got an interest in compiler and parser, parser technology. I fly little planes and I play lots of, lots of video games. So if anyone's got a Switch, for example, from Nintendo, you can play some games with me later if you like. Um, my Twitter account is Asian K, so if you want to follow me on Twitter or tweet about this talk and give me feedback, you're more than welcome to do that at any time. So, the agenda for today. Um, I want to briefly introduce Kotlin because I wasn't really sure if everyone attending would have used Kotlin to any extent. So we'll do a Kotlin in three minutes. Then we'll talk about the need for coroutines or what they actually do. Then we'll look at some examples how to use coroutines in Kotlin code. And that is quite independent of Android at that stage. And then we look at some more specific scenarios for coroutines on Android and some libraries for doing that. And just to give you a bit of a history, um, most people probably got into Kotlin because they've been Android developers and all of a sudden found a cool language that is better than Java. My way is actually different. I was a Kotlin developer before I did Android. So I was using Kotlin as a replacement for Java on the backend because that's the other thing I do. I do quite a lot of Java backend development or JVM based backend development. And at some point I came across Kotlin, did that when it was like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and not really stable enough for production, unfortunately. And then I realized, hey, people do Android with that stuff. That's cool, let's play with Android. So that's my way, why I'm here actually, because like two or three years, or three years ago, I started doing Android with Kotlin and kind of morphed into the Android community more or less. So Kotlin in three minutes. So some bit of history. JetBrains, the guys behind Kotlin, they wanted a language for the JVM that was better suited for their own product development. Because Java, for a lot of reasons, wasn't cutting it in, basically. So they looked at stuff like Scala and Groovy and other languages, but eventually came up with their own language spec that was then shown at an event called the JVM Language Summit in 2011, first public appearance basically. All of a sudden, Android developers picked it up around 2014, and mainly for the reasons because you could do all the cool stuff like lambdas and higher order functions, um, and it still worked on Java 6 for old versions of Android basically, which you couldn't do easily at the time with Java. It has a low methods count, that's still around seven, 8,000 basically, so you can easily use it with, um, with Android. And it basically has a strong focus on a very efficient, bloat-free language. And we've seen this in you know, previous sessions this morning basically. You know, like um, how nice code can look and be when you actually move it away from Java. So then in 2016, we had a 1.0 release, and that was basically followed by multiple maintenance releases, so there is a 1.0.7 now in that development line. Then 1.1 was released in 2017, that's currently at 1.1.60. Um, and that introduced that experimental new feature, Kotlin Coroutines, why we're actually here and what we're gonna talk about. Now in 2017, Kotlin became the official Android or an official Android language at Google I.O. And later this year, later last year, in late November or early December, um, Wonder 2 was actually released. And that brought stuff like Java 9 compatibility, multi-platform projects, um, massive improvements to the standard library and some other bits and pieces. And interestingly enough, coroutines are still experimental in Wonder 2. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means further down the track. Um, for now, it shouldn't stop you from treating it as a useful feature because what JetBrains seems to consider experimental is code that other, you know, other manufacturers and vendors would treat as highly stable actually. So, you know, coroutines are, coroutines are actually quite good. So obviously, we have a strong community. There's lots of interesting frameworks popping up. People write libraries for Kotlin. 
and there's really, really good support from JetBrains for the whole unit. Some of the prominent language features, and I'll just show them here, I'm not going into them in, in any detail, is stuff like the immutability with var and vel. Um, we've got the null support or explicit null handling. Uh, we've got stuff like the data class, which are really cool extension functions, lambdas, type inference, tons of stuff like syntactic sugar to make your code look cool and, and modern. And we've got a really good um, Java Kotlin interoperability. So you can actually quite easily in a project, regardless if it's Android or if it's Java backend or Java Swing or whatever you can think of, use Kotlin and, and, and Java together. Um, and a lot of Android projects I've been involved in um, have done a step-by-step -step migration. So it used to be maybe a Java-based app and they converted activity by activity or layer by layer to Kotlin. And that works really well. So let's have a look at coroutines. And let's start with trying to get a motivation why we want coroutines and what they actually are. So one thing we find is asynchronous programming it's obviously becoming increasingly important. We have lots of stuff that needs to happen in an asynchronous way, in an app or in backend code as well. Yeah. And in traditional Java backend land, you would use threads for that normally. The problem with that whole asynchronous programming stuff is you need to avoid blocking. And if you want to avoid blocking code, it usually introduces a lot of complexity you know, synchronizing and locking and taking care of different things to make sure that your application still runs or that your, I, your, that your UI doesn't freeze all of a sudden. So for example, with threads specifically, you'll find they are very expensive to create and manage and they are quite limited. And limited mainly because threads on the JDM have a very close relationship to native threads, like to operating system threads. And operating system threads are expensive and they are limited. You can't create unlimited amounts of operating system threads because at some point you run out of memory on the stack. <coughs> so that's a problem. Then threads are complex to handle if you have applications with lots of immutable state. And even though we are saying like you shouldn't have immutable state, the reality is quite a lot of applications have to deal with that. And if you have UI-driven applications like a Java desktop app or an Android app, it becomes even more complex because you have to deal with stuff like certain things can't happen on the main thread or the UI thread, and you have to shift stuff into the background and yada, yada, yada. What that quite often leads to is what is known as callback hell. And callback hell is even more prominent in JavaScript. So I do also JavaScript and um, TypeScript development occasionally. And you come sometimes across like stuff like that. And it just makes your eyes bleed and you want to cry because it's like, oh God, where do I even start, right? And if you do more than really basic asynchronous development, even in Java or in Android, you come across stuff like that, like that callback help. The problem is like, you know, some other approaches like reactive, RxJava, for example, they try to make that better, but you end up still writing code that is written and looks like with asynchronity in mind. Ideally, you would just write your code as it happens. You would write like, go to the network, get me some data, show that data in my recycler view, for example, and here's an event handler for a button, something like that. And it's like synchronous code, A, B, C, D, step by step. That's how you would want your code to look like. And you would ideally not have to write Rx Java code and make sure that fits into the framework or starting threads or closing threads and managing threads. And Kotlin coroutines try to guide you towards a solution like that, where, they, where you write normal code as you think about that code and the asynchronity is kind of push to the side, basically. It just happens magically. If that is always the case, you know, we'll see that. So coroutines are quite interesting, right? Because they are a really old concept. They come from a language called Simula 67. Yeah, that was back in the day when computer languages 
had the year they were created in the name. So this is a language from 1967, basically. And the authors of that language, they came up with the concept of detach and resume keywords to suspend and then later resume execution of certain things. And that's the first time I personally think coroutines showed up in programmer. But for whatever reason, um, the industry then in the 70s, 80s, 90s kind of stopped thinking towards that, that line and everything was about multi-threading. Um, and the first modern language where ideas of coroutines and that async await kind of model came back was C-sharp in like 2011 or something like that or 2010. And the, the language has async and await as language level keywords. Then Go is another language where we have coroutines as part of the language in a modern language. In Kotlin, the approach is actually kind of similar to, um, to Singular 67's approach. So they have a concept that's called suspending functions. And the idea is it's a function or a lambda that can be suspended and later resumed. So you can say, I've got a function, and right now I want to stop with that function and you know, come back to it at a later stage. The cool thing is this idea requires no context switching on the JVM or operating system level. So that leads to a scenario where it becomes really cheap to create code. Um, the core language, Kotlin, <coughs> has actually a really minimal integration. So you'll find, we'll get to that in a few minutes, that most of the functionality of coroutines sits on a mid-level library layer above the core language. And the cool thing about that is you can take that mid-level library layer and implement a lot of your own ideas and APIs on top of that. So you have a very flexible API system that um, is not really tied to the core language level, so you are quite flexible in what you want to do and how you're going to do it. And from a coding point of view, <coughs> writing co coroutines code is kind of supposed to be like writing traditional code in the end. So the easiest way to kind of try to think about a coroutine is a very light <coughs> thread. Um, they can run in parallel, like threads can do. They can wait for each other. Also, like threads can do, they can communicate with each other. They have all those features that we would want for asynchronous programming. But they are extremely cheap to create. And one thread can run lots of coroutines. And literally, we talk about well, lots. We'll see an example for that in a few minutes as well. So, in current Kotlin, and that's specifically for Kotlin 1.2, because a few details have changed, we have multiple integration points. On the language support level, like the stuff that is really in Kotlin, the only bit is really a suspend keyword that allows us to write functions that can be suspended. Anything else above that is in libraries. Um, so we've got a low-level library in a package called kotlin.coroutines, and that basically has stuff like functions, for example, create coroutine, um, start coroutine, suspend coroutine. So that goes above that suspend function level and adds some value. It also has some generator um, setups to build sequences and to build iterators. And in, in practice, you probably, as application developers, will never look at that unless you're writing a framework or a library yourself. Above that, we've got kind of mid-level libraries in Kotlin X coroutines. Subtle difference, different package. Um, and that's where you find most of the functionality you will use on a day-to-day -day business um, when writing coroutines code. For example, all the launchers to start coroutines in different scenarios. And on top of that, we've got high-level libraries, for example, Enco. Enco, um, and David talked about that this morning briefly in his talk about moving Java to Kotlin, uh, Java code to Kotlin. Enco is kind of a very 
versatile library for Kotlin and Android that gives you uh, view, a view DSL to lay out your views in a different way, SQL light libraries, logging libraries, and a bunch of other things. But it also has support for coroutines, and Enco itself has a way to deal with async and the wait to do asynchronous um, coding. So let's have a bit of a look at how we can use coroutines in Kotlin code. So for a start, the absolute minimum you need to use is Kotlin 114. So obviously no one should use that anymore. You really wanna, if you are for whatever reason stuck on Kotlin 1.1, you wanna be at least on 1.150, or really on 1.2 nowadays. And because, uh, because coroutines are still experimental officially, you have to enable them as an experimental feature in Gradle with like um, the little Kotlin experimental coroutines enable statement in your build file. The main reason for that is to avoid all the stupid warnings you otherwise get when you compile your code. Um, from a functionality point of view, it will work without that, but it's just annoying to have to deal with all those models. And then the compile dependency you want to add is Kotlin X coroutines core in version 0.22.5. And that is the matching coroutines library version for the current Kotlin 1.2.3. Um, so when you play with that stuff, you always have to make sure that you, you know, choose the, the matching libraries. It can sometimes be a bit like, you know, having a look what is actually currently supported and how they match together. So hello world. Um, Show you the code. We've got a function here, main, so we can execute that whole thing. And basically, what we're doing is we'll print something to the console saying start on main thread. Then we've got a launch block, we'll come to that in a second. That launch block has a delay function in here, so it delays whatever that actually means for five seconds. Print something that comes from the code routine. And outside on the main thread, we have another hello on the main thread. We put that thread to sleep for now and explain in a few seconds why we do that for 10 seconds. And then we stop on the main thread. And what is going to happen here is basically, let me have a look if that's the right thing. If I just run that. So we're starting on the main thread, hello on the main thread. Now that main thread is put to sleep for 10 seconds, but still after five seconds, our coroutine says, hello, I'm here, then stop on the main thread and we're done. And what you'll basically see with that launch statement is launch is what's called a coroutine builder. And launch starts a new coroutine, in this case here, on a thing that is called the common pool. The common pool is basically a <coughs> flat pool. And inside our coroutine, we basically just, for now, for this demonstration, do a delay, five seconds, and then do a print statement. Obviously, that's where you would actually do some normal work, some calculation or some processing, or a network call, or whatever you can, can imagine. So the interesting thing, though, is this delay function you see this little icon here? The wavy line and the arrow? That's in IntelliJ or Android Studio, the indication for this is a suspend function call. So delay is a suspend function, which means it can, it's non-blocking. It can stop its execution and resume its execution later. The slightly tricky bit is with those suspend function calls, they can't run on a main thread. They have to run in a coroutine <coughs> context, and that's why, in this case, it has to sit on in the launch block. I couldn't take delay, for example, and put it here instead of thread.sleep. That would just not even compile, because it would be a suspend function on the main thread. So the problem with this code is, obviously, oh, sorry, that slide loads again, is obviously that it's kind of a bit stupid, right? I have to put the main thread to sleep for five sec for 10 seconds so that I can even see what happens in my coroutine after five seconds. So in reality, this is a nice little world, but 
it doesn't really, you know, you would never have it. <coughs> Let's have a look at a hello world better. So we want to wait for the coroutine to finish. So what launch basically does is, we didn't use that on the previous slide, it returns a job object. So if we have a look at this code here, the only difference is now my launch statement gets assigned to a value job. Nothing changes. And then down here, I say job.join instead of my main thread artificially waiting for nothing better to happen. Um, so what this will do if we were to execute that, exactly the same behavior, exactly the same output, it would just not wait 10 seconds. It will just, when the coroutine is finished after five seconds, or five seconds and a bit for the print, basically, it will um, continue on the main thread and show stop on the main thread. Right? And that's a quite common thing you would do. If you use the launch coroutine builder, you'll just go and, um, and essentially join at some point to resume execution. So let's have a look at threads versus coroutines. So here's an example where we create 10,000 threads printing a dot. And each of the threads waits for a second, basically. And then further down here, I'm just running a for each, and I join all the threads together. On the next slide, before we actually jump back to IntelliJ, we have a similar scenario with coroutines. So here I'm creating 10,000 coroutines in the common pool. Do the same thing, print a dot and wait a second basically in the coroutine, and then join them all together at the end. And what we'll see is that now we'll probably get very different behaviors. So here's the thread example. Let's run that quickly. Did you see that? Except you. Because I'm running out of threads. Even with 10,000. Right? So now let's have a look at the coroutine version. Damn, no problem at all. So, okay, if I, well that was just 1,000. To be fair, let's make, make a 10,000 for the other one. Oh, you know what? Let's make 100 though. Why not? Done. Do you want to see a million or 10 million? It's not a problem at all, basically. So, coroutines are really lightweight and really cheap to create and run. And it's amazing when you compare them to the heaviness of threads. So, here. Another interesting example comparing threads and coroutines. Here we've got threads, and what we basically do is we measure the time it creates, it takes to create like a million threads that probably won't really run again. Uh, let me just try that. Oh no, it will run actually, because yeah, it will run in this case. Um, this will most likely run for about a minute. I just continue with the slides, and we'll come back to that in in a second. And then I'll show you the um, the coroutines equivalent. So we've seen the launch coroutine builder, and with that launch builder returning a job, you can use the job reference to join them all together. The problem is, in practice, you most likely would want to get a result back from a coroutine from your computation. And async await is a model to do that. So async is another coroutine builder. It starts a new coroutine and it refers to the deferred object. And the deferred object, something like, the closest you can think of it is like a promise or a future in Java or JavaScript. Um, when you get that deferred object back, you can then call the await method of it and it returns the result of that coroutine's execution. The await function specifically needs to be called inside a coroutine because await is a suspending function 
and it suspends in a non-blocking way, similar to the delay function that we saw earlier. So if we want to do this whole async await thing, the easiest way is wrap it into a run blocking coroutine, and we'll have a look at some code um, in a second. That will start the coroutine and wait <coughs> until it's finished. And here's an example. We've got um, an async block that just basically adds up numbers, returns the thirds, and yet down here I've got run blocking, which is a coroutine that just runs code in a blocking coroutine, basically. Um, and then I call the sum by collection function on the deferred objects. Uh, as a lambda, pass in it it dot away to get the result of the coroutine and print out the sum. Before we look at that code in practice, let's go back to this thing here. So, created one million threads in 49 seconds, for example. Have a look what happens with the coroutines here. So one million coroutines, same code, same adding stuff up. Luckily, I know that will actually be quite quick. So we're done. Five hundred ninety milliseconds. It's kind of a no-brainer, right? Like, what is the potential better approach here? So I wanted to show you the async await example. <coughs> Yeah. yeah. So we're adding up those numbers. Um, we want to get a result back, and the result of that async is basically the number of our iteration. If I run this, it creates what is that even? 180 million something, which is basically the sum <coughs> of all the numbers between 1 and 60,000 at this stage. So, one interesting thing here. Um, if I increase that to 70,000, I'm not sure if anyone can predict what's going to happen. Oh, that's weird, eh? So, anyone got an idea what happened here? Overflow. Yeah, I exceeded end, basically. And that's something that really started to annoy me, basically, because I thought, like, ah, okay, that's a bit stupid. And I change the 70,000 to long. So like, I just add up long values, right? And what happens then, I can show you that here quickly, um, is if I do this, ah, all of a sudden my sum by collection function doesn't work anymore because Kotlin's <coughs> sum by function only works for int. <laughs> and there is a sum by double, but there's no sum by lo long, for example, or sum by whatever, anything else. Which is fair enough, you know, as a language designer, I think you have to make decisions where you say like, yeah, that's supported, all the other stuff. If you really need that, you're out of your own. The solution, and I'll show you that quickly, is in here. Uh, no, it's not, where is it? Oh, it's here. So, I basically wrote a sum by long as an extension function. And the cool thing is with Kotlin, extension functions allow you to just add functionality to types without having to do crazy stuff with extending the class and all that stuff. So I'm just saying like, hey, I've got that iterable um, type T and I wanna add sum by long, which is basically really exactly the same code that is in sum by int, just for long. So they don't give it to me, I just code it myself. And then in this example here, which has some other bits, but now I can actually add up like from one to one million as long. <coughs> and then in my blocking code here, I just call sum by long, and it will add up long values. And actually give me the proper value for up to a million or even a lot. You know, I can actually work with the data that long. So that's an easy way around those kind of limitations in Kotlin, luckily. So quickly about those suspend functions. Um, we talked about coroutines and that they can suspend without blocking a thread. Um, the suspend functions have to use a keyword called suspend, and they can only be called from another suspend function or from a coroutine block. <coughs> so, the practical example here, we've got async await, and now instead of summing up stuff here, I'm actually calling a function. 
But because this function is now potentially suspending execution, non-blocking, I have to actually make do work suspend function in this example. And then this is just like simulating some work by saying 50 millisecond delay, which have a number of blah, blah, blah. So what happens behind the scenes, though, for this whole code team magic, um, we already said they are quite light on language features. So there's not a lot built into the language. Suspend is the only new keyword that was added to the Kotlin core language. And to be honest, really what that thing does is it's a compiler flag in code. So whenever the Kotlin compiler runs over a suspend keyword, it treats that differently and creates different bytecode. So there are some other things like continuation and coroutine contacts. Um, and all the other stuff is in the Kotlin X coroutine library. Some more behind the scenes stuff. So at compilation time, um, the suspending functions, the compiler <coughs> flag, get basically um, gets compiled to a function with a callback interface of type continuation. So every function that is suspending gets kind of another argument of type continuation put into its argument list. And what that does is, it can then be used as suspension points in a state machine. So if you've done a com computer science degree, and you have at some point did stuff like machine uh, theory and um, state machines and compiler stuff, you'll know that a state machine is kind of equivalent to a regular expression, and there's a whole bunch of theory behind that. But that's what Kotlin does here, basically. It's a state machine with very defined states that tracks what is currently running and what is currently suspended. And you know those things like launch, be on, blocking, async, blah, 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 they are just code to build up. So launch versus async. Um, launch returns a job, no resulting value. Async returns a deferred object, and that's a future that can be used later with a wait to get the value of this code to um, code in execution. Async is generally better suited um, for most scenarios when you have like independent concurrent flows where you want to get data back and computation results back. You can do stuff like waiting and canceling. So for example, you can cancel the code team's execution and then join, um, or you can use an extension function called cancel and join, doing both in one go. And an example for that looks like that. So I've got a code team that gets launched here. Um, I repeat something 1,000 times, like I'm sitting here and delaying dot, 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 and wait 500 milliseconds in this case. But then on the main thread, I've got a delay of 1.3 seconds. And after that 1.3 seconds, while the code team has executed three times, um, I cancel the job gets joined, and I'm saying, like, I'm back on the main thread. So that's another quick example here. So if we look at, oh, oh, that's because I have a compilation error in the whole project. Obviously, then, this file can't work. <coughs> executes three times mm -hmm. from the code team at zero at 500 milliseconds at one second. Then after 1.3 seconds, we continue here, gets canceled, and it basically says I'm overweighting, let's go do something else. The tricky bit with canceling is your code team has to be cancelable, and not all of them are. Cancelable basically relies on um, your code to cooperate. So it has to be able to check regularly, am I canceled or am I about to be canceled? All the built-in suspend functions in the language or in the library automatically are cooperating, but your own code might not. And you can check that with stuff like um, is active, or you can use a yield function to yield results from the code team. So there are different ways to deal with that. Um, another typical thing is timeouts, you know, because quite often, if you want to cancel a protein in timeout in the network or something like that. So you can, the easiest way to do that is use a with timeout protein builder. You can say like, oh, repeat this, but the, you know, there's a timeout of 1.3 seconds. 
and then you get a timeout cancellation exception. And there's tons more around the concepts of coroutines, like contacts and threads and channels and pipelines, which goes way beyond what you know, we can really talk about here. But let's have a look at specifically what happens in Android. So in general with Android and any UI-driven app, we need to be aware of long-running processes. In Android specifically, you can't even do any networking on the UI thread, right? So it's just not possible. Um, so we need to avoid long-running operations because otherwise you get applications not responding and our users can cancel the application. And then it gets locked in Google Play Console and in the error handling, it's just not nice. So um, if you wanna use coding on Android, there's a specific Android library for that in the Kotlin X package. And there are also similar libraries for Java FX and Java Swing that kind of provide UI helpers for coroutines in Android. Um, particularly in Android, we have, oh, through that library, we get a context for the UI thread. So in code, we can now say, launch in the UI context, for example, setting the text of a, um, the text property of a text field, then delay it 500 milliseconds and basically update that thing by essentially implementing a countdown from like 10 to one or something like that. And what happens then is this runs non-blocking, the UI is not frozen, and the code team is nicely launched in our UI thread. Um, you can do UI updates, you can use the sending functions, it's all kind of smooth. In <coughs> Stuff, with stuff like jobs and launch, general principle of coroutines apply in Android as well. So we've got a job reference, can be canceled with cancel. Um, in UI context specifically, you can do nice things like, for example, have an unclick handler for a view, and that um, basically takes, or you write your own coroutine as an extension function. So you have like the action being a suspendable function, to unit and we're setting the unclick listener here, launch and whatever the action is we've passed in here. And then for example, you can do button on click and um, just pass in whatever you want to do and that gets automatically ex executed in the UI thread to the launch call team. So it's a very elegant way of dealing with that. Other UI thread concerns, um, jump over those quickly because they are more topics for further study. So there's a concept called actors and event conflation and that leads you into looking how events are handled through coroutines and channels. That's really interesting but again it goes way beyond like an introduction session. So thread blocking operations in the UI. So usually um, we want to avoid stuff blocking, right? So we have to deal with CPU intensive computations and API calls. They can't be done from the UI thread or from UI thread confined coroutine. Solution is we need to use a suspend function with the execution context common tool. So here's an example. We've got a Fibonacci calculating thing. That suspend function fib calls fib blocking. So that's actually blocking code theoretically. But we run that in a run coroutine. And the reason why we do it this way is we want to avoid run being part of a recursive call. So here, fib is the entry point, and then we call fib blocking, and fib blocking just calls itself. But it means the run coroutine launcher is not recursive, and we save basically on some overhead for doing that. For network calls, um, typical use case, <coughs> we want to have a nice callback free API and be able to handle offline ex exceptions. So here's an example, function get users, that, refers, uh, that returns me a list of, or a deferred with a list of users. And that get users returns an async coroutine. Um, in here, I'm doing my request, and I'm getting a response, and then I pass the response, and all the magic of dealing with timeouts and dealing with um, callbacks doesn't exist, it gets dealt with by another code team. Exception handling, you can do stuff like use 
the results object await function that gives us the data and suspends the coroutine. And we can use the launch builder to trigger the execution of the user. So here we've got launch on the UI thread. We'll try to use that get users function from the previous slide. Then we maybe set some stuff in the adapter, but we don't set the actual result because we might not have that. We set result.await. And that leads to basically um, calling the await function on the deferred object that gives us the data. But at the same time, I can catch an exception and basically treat offline behavior if that UI call, uh, that, that network call is happening. So, ENCO, briefly on that, it's quite often identified with declarative UI in Android and Kotlin. Um, it has a whole bunch of other APIs like async and SQLite. And as I actually learned this morning in logging, I totally wasn't aware of that. Um, and in ENCO 0 0.9, JetBrains introduced some naming changes around the ASUN API, and that was really interesting um, because they pretty much renamed the keyword of how you would do ASUN in ANCO 0 0.9, and that was before the Kotlin 1.1 release, before anyone knew coroutines were a thing. And then coroutines got released, and all of a sudden it's like, ah, they changed that because now coroutines have ASUN await. And then since ANCO 0 0.10, we have support for coroutines in, in, in so the dependency is basically kind of simple to add. Um, we get some new stuff like quarantine the listeners, a background launcher, and as reference launcher. And you can do things like have some data retrieving functions to or get data and show data. And then on the UI thread, do stuff like give me the data in the background thread or in a background thread, and then just show it data So that's another way of making things a bit more accessible to us. There's another framework I just want to briefly mention called async await that's based on top of the coroutines library, but this particular framework, I'm not really sure where that's going because it hasn't been really updated since a few months. So just be aware, and it's on the resource at the end, that it exists. I'm not sure if that's a thing still. The nice thing is it has plugins for Retrofit and RxJava. Speaking of RxJava, there are tons of things you can do to make them work together, coroutines and RxJava. There's an interop library um, that's called Org JetBrains, Kotlin X, Kotlin X Coroutines Rx2. There's also one for Rx1, and there are two more for some other um, reactive approaches. <coughs> and basically, the interoperability in both directions gives you some functions or things like um, coroutine builders, depending on how you look at things. So you can use both of them together. Is it worth that? I don't know. Um, but from a method point of method count point of view and from an APK size point of view, coroutines are actually less methods and smaller APK size than RxJava. However, that being said, if you are an RxJava expert, and you like it, there's no point in moving to coroutines. However, I would say coroutines are easier to learn. If you start a new project or if you start a new team, then it's better to do that. The interop libraries that I mentioned was that before, they add quite a lot to the method count in the APK size. So if you do the interop stuff, your files will be quite significantly bigger. So you can unit test it, and I'll leave you to um, the slide deck to have a look at that yourself. Just one word on the experimental bit to the end. So they are considered experimental, but it's a very sound approach to dealing with concurrency and ASOC. JetBrains guarantees backwards compatibility. That means old code compiled with coroutines will continue to work. They do not guarantee forward compatibility, which means new code that you write now might not work with old runtime of coroutines or Kotlin 1.1, for example. I think they can and should be used in production, and they have an extremely low learning curve compared to other approaches for async and um, concurrency. There's a whole bunch of resources. You don't need to take a photo, because I'll give you the link to the slides in a second, actually. Here are my contact details. The slides are on my SlideShare account already. So if you go to slideshare.com, slash agent K, which is conveniently my Twitter account as well, 
then you can grab some slide deck. Um, like I said, if you want to provide feedback, just ping me on Twitter. I'm on Telegram as well, or you can, worst case, send me the email if you like. Thanks a lot for listening. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take one or two maybe, because we've got another five minutes. Um, but otherwise, I'll be around for the rest of the day or later today to answer more questions. Thanks a lot.